Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Academy, the virtual design learning platform by me on Middle East Architecture Lab. My name is Riyad Jokha. I'm joining from Dubai, and I'll be moderating today's public lecture, the last lecture of semester two of our program. This is a keynote lecture by Jesse Weiser and Nanako Umemoto of RUR Architecture DPC. They're joining me from York. And if you haven't already, please check out the last few remaining classes in semester two. We have a couple of uh, technical classes on Maya and Python which would be very beneficial if, if you'd like to get to know the software. And you can always refer to liveacademy.tv for the beginner classes that we're putting up there after the live sessions. Q&A will be taken after the session. So if you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box and I will read it out to Jesse and Nanako. And we will be also taking live questions. So if you'd like to use the raise hand tool, we will promote you to panelists and you can ask your question personally to Jesse and Nanako. So host will help me by posting some of these links and full tips in the chat. So make sure you read those. And I'm very excited for today's lecture because the Atlas of Novel Tectonics is still one of my favorite architecture books to read. The book is very approachable and easy to read and breaks down the great work of Jesse and Nanako of RUR Architecture DPC into a series of very easy to explain, almost um, storytelling uh, narratives. And so I highly recommend it if you haven't read it yet. I've read it a few times myself. It was recommended to me on the reading list of the master's degree that I pursued at BAA. And I, I was just telling Jesse and Nanako that I wanted to buy a new copy. But also they have a new book coming up, which they'll discuss with you once they start. I became fascinated with their work when I read the book, but also afterwards, I had an opportunity to meet them in Hong Kong. They gave a lecture there. We also met up for a coffee in New York while I was interviewing for some jobs. And they were so kind to give me their time and a lot of precious advice on which company to go for. So I'm very grateful for that. And we discussed some opportunities to collaborate in Dubai since I had a foot there. And here we are. So I'm really happy for this opportunity and really, really honored that they gave us some of their time. I'm also just been informed that the O14 in Dubai has received a 10-year award from the International Council on Tall Buildings, which is very exciting and very timely with the time of this, of this lecture. So... That's really great news. So thanks again to Jesse and Nanako joining us from New York. RUR Architecture DPC is a multidisciplinary design firm formed in 1983 and operating at a wide range of scales from furniture design to residential and commercial structures up to the scale of landscape, urban design and infrastructure. Jesse Weiser is a registered architect in New York and principal of RUR Architecture DPC. He received his Bachelor of Architecture degree from the Cooper Union in New York and completed his Master's of Architecture at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. He was a fellow of the American Academy in Rome in 1985, and has worked for offices of uh, John Hedtuk and Aldo Rossi. Jesse is a professor of architecture at Princeton University, and has previously taught at various schools of architecture across the globe, to name a few, Columbia University, Hong Kong University, Ohio State University, and is lectured widely in different uh, locations. Nanako Omomoto is a principal of RUR Architecture DPC. She received her Bachelor of Architecture from the Cooper Union in New York in 1983, following studies at the School of Urban Design and Landscape Architecture at the Osaka uh, University of Art. Nanako has taught various schools in the US, Europe, and Asia, including Harvard University, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, Columbia University, and EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland as well as Hong Kong University, Kyoto University, and the Cooper Union. And she has lectured widely at various educational and cultural institutions throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. I'm very excited for this lecture today by Raisa Umumoto. So please join me in welcoming them for their keynote lecture at Live Academy Semester 2. Thank you, um, Riyadh, for the wonderful introduction. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to contribute uh, conversation and work uh, with the Live Academy, Nanako and I um, uh, you know, have, have lectured many times and in many kinds of formats, but I find already that there's a certain interesting hominess <laughs> to, to this format, which I really appreciate, some connection to the audience, which is really appreciated. I guess we can uh, go right in. Uh, to to the talk. So we'll be presenting uh, three uh, projects, uh, either constructed or about to be finished. The L14 Tower, as you can see, 
the Taipei Music Center and the Kaohsiung Port Terminal. First, we just want to talk a little bit about you know, our practice, which is somewhat unusual, I would say, in the context of the United States and New York. I think because Nanako worked in Japan and I worked for a period in, in Italy, we based our practice somewhat unrealistically, I would say, in retrospect, on doing competitions almost exclusively. Much of our work is unbuilt. We fortunately, you know, had the opportunity either, you know, to win some competitions like in Taipei Pop or Kaohsiung or the O14 Tower, which actually wasn't a competition per se, but uh, came out of a competition. So it's a very different world from when we started. But I would say that, you know, one of the advantages of the competition format is that you really, I mean, aside from, of course, the desire to win the competition, you have a very unique opportunity to develop your own ideas, which was, you know, part of the reason, I, I suppose, um, that we were drawn to this way of working. And so also it's inseparable in, in a sense with teaching. And that is to say, uh, you know, that you use these kinds of competitions as a form of design research uh, that you can really advance and push forward ideas in that format, uh, more so in many respects than you know typical private commissions. So there it is. That's uh, been our uh, kind of modus operandi for the past what thirty years, uh, and hopefully we can also get commissions at this point because it's much better in other respects. And anyway, uh, uh, let's jump into uh, the first project, the O14 Tower in Dubai. As I mentioned, the uh, O14 project was a commission, but it um, emerged from an earlier competition uh, for the main building at Business Bay. And we were fortunate to work with a wonderful uh, developer, Shahab Lutfi, who kind of ran that competition and uh, appreciated our work and then asked us to do his first, essentially his first development project when he went out on his own. So uh, he was an, he's an extremely important uh, kind of figure for us because he gave us uh, you know, the kind of boost in us and support uh, that a young office, you know, speculative office really need. Dubai was a very new context for us, uh, you know, almost, you know, and, and at the time, uh, you know, construction, the construction boom at, in Dubai was in its full swing. Buildings were appearing uh, seemingly out of the desert, uh, you know, uh, and the whole kind of presence of the urbanism was something entirely new to us. Uh, and it, but we saw it also as an opportunity um, because of uh, Shahab's support to really uh, try to rethink the type of buildings, the tower typology specifically, uh, that would be appropriate to the environment uh, of Dubai. And so he gave us that opportunity. Our uh, good friend Khalid Al Najjar, who I think might be watching at this moment, um, who was a former student at Columbia and a long time friend, you know, brought us uh, to uh, Shahab and got us involved in that initial competition. The urbanism in Dubai, the planned urbanism, the kind of themed site, is very important to the way to the new Dubai uh, developed. So all of the urban elements were more or less, uh, you know, kind of uh, based on themes, more or less monofunctional. And it was a kind of constellation of those strung out uh, along uh, the main highway, Sheikh Zayed Road, uh, which was, you know, part of the kind of master planning uh, scheme. But it also, uh, you know, afforded a unique opportunity to try to rethink um, the office tower, ours uh, is in Business Bay. And, you know, of course, we weren't in Dubai in 1991, but 
uh, just the showing this slide just to illustrate, you know, the radical shift, uh, you know, from 1991 to the Dubai of 2005, when we first became familiar, you know, with with the city, just uh, incredible energy and uh, you know, force of development uh, in a seemingly tabula rasa environment. But the other thing in retrospect, and this came out, uh, you know, in, in our you know, discussion in our 014 book, was that Dubai is not entirely unique in this, um, that many cities uh, have, especially in the East uh, and Far East and Middle East, have undergone these uh, kinds of radical and rapid transformations. So a new species of urbanism, one could say, has emerged out of the, uh, the social, political, monetary energies uh, you know, that have come to form these metropolises. And an architecture uh, which is somewhat unfamiliar, especially to us who are, you know, kind of in, an, in a relatively old city, New York, um, the almost the incongruous con uh, juxtaposition of building types, styles, and so forth is something that, uh, you know, uh, really pushed very hard uh, against our assumptions about how to deal with a context like this. So this was a, uh, a rendering. This was our first introduction to Dubai. This was an early uh, master plan uh, for Business Bay where we ultimately built the 014 tower. But at this point, uh, we were invited to uh, join a competition uh, to build the central uh, tower in the center of that circle that you see there. This, these are, you know, kind of entirely master plan cities. Rendering actually belies what you actually encounter when you get there. So this was that center of the circle when we visited for the first time. In a sense, just an idea at that point. That little post in the center is the center of the circle where ultimately, you know, a new kind of symbolic uh, tower. Ultimately, I think it was reprogrammed as a stock exchange uh, was to be built. And these were our competitors. So um, OMA's Dubai Renaissance, which was kind of a rotating slab with one sort of point transformation where there's a, like, a meeting room. Zaha Hadid's Dancing Towers, uh, which ultimately was the winner of the competition. And Morphosis's Burj Al Maidan, uh, project. I won't explain that project, but only to say that Shahab was fascinated with our proposal for this kind of 84-story mixed-use building, which included office uh, space in the lower separated towers, and then as the towers join uh, in a kind of folded slab building, uh, there would be um, both uh, residences and hotels. So. Uh, the first uh, kind of inclination, what uh, he wanted us to consider uh, for a 22-story, at that point, mixed-use tower, was a, almost a miniature of the 84-story uh, proposal. So we went through even more than 16 iterations to try to kind of capture uh, the kind of uh, formal complexity, but also the programmatic differences uh, between, uh, at that point, office space mixed with um, office, uh, with, with residential. Ultimately, the scale shift was too great to continue that project, and then we had to step back and really uh, radically rethink the project. Um, the mixed-use version began as a more amorphic project, uh, uh, a cruciform uh, but with you know kind of extra folds in it, in a way, um, the kind of remaining uh, formal uh, development from the earlier project that, as we developed the uh, model, uh, got ironed out and uh, regularized, rationalized in a sense for construction, uh, and also during the course of the design process, um, the the program changed. So uh, it was mixed use at first uh, with office 
at the bottom, as you can see, and residential uh, at the top. So it, in a way, kind of bellied out at the bottom for kind of full plate offices, and then the cruciform thinned out for residences. Um, later on, it went all the uh, completely to office space, uh, and that then had an effect on the envelope. Our first um, solution was more typically what we found in Dubai with kind of curtain wall uh, building, glass and curtain wall structure. Um, but then we began to really reconsider uh, the appropriateness of what are seemingly normative buildings in Dubai. And uh, had a kind of a moment to basically reflect and we ultimately rejected that and went to a more uh, you know, speculative uh, design, one that um, uh, was much more challenging both for us, for the engineer and the developer. And you know, uh, it, was a, it was a ride, I'll say. So basically, uh, we took the structure, and this is really a notional diagram, but pulled what would normally be the columns within the structure out to an exoskeleton. Uh, the exoskeleton uh, had you know, some real benefits in that it uh, would also serve as a shading device. It would make the, uh, the floor plates uh, column free and more open. Uh, and then it also, as we developed it, had very uh, specific and uh, very useful environmental effects. In a sense, and this is retrospective, um, it forms uh, a kind of connection to another lineage of tower. Uh, the, the plan on the left and section are by Frank Lloyd Wright, the St. Mark's Tower. Uh, there, uh, Wright uh, uses a kind of trunk, tree trunk and tray model, kind of the cruciform, uh, and all of the structure is more or less concentrated inside. Also, basically column free, uh, everything cantilevers off of that cruciform. And we, our 014 tower, basically uh, uses that idea, but then pulls structure to the exterior. The floor plates basically hang within shell rather than cantilevering off. There were moments when, uh, because of anxiety about uh, constructional difficulty of the diagrid, uh, there was a normalizing of the shell, many different kinds of exercises. We were very happy that this was not the solution, but this would end up being uh, not a diagrid, not a kind of a, a form active structure, but rather a kind of a stack veer and deal structure. And luckily our structural engineer who happened to be our professor at the Cooper Union, Israel Sinek, was able to effectively argue uh, against normalizing the pattern of structure and to keep the true diagrid. Another benefit of that diagrid is that um, you could have a very light core that because the outer structure is so rigid, um, you don't need uh, a, a very kind of reinforced core to deal with seismic or wind forces that the outer shell, like a nuclear reactor shell, uh, takes all of those forces very, very easily. And there were really interesting kind of detail moments as well, uh, because the shell of the building uh, changes thickness, not gradually, which was too expensive. That was the first um, sort of exercise, but that there would be a kind of step in the thickness of the shell. Uh, at the change in thickness, we had to develop a new uh, kind of detail uh, that would kind of take up uh, the difference in th shell thickness. And you could see it in the uh, openings of the shell, there's a kind of step and a reveal, and that's the moment when uh, the shell of the building goes from, uh, uh, I think, 60 centimeters to 40. In working with Israel, we were, you know, discussing the kind of uh, relationship to natural forms, uh, and also forms by architects, but the kind of what they call lacuna canalicular bone structure that you find inside a humerus bone, 
or the diagrid structure in cactus, or even you know in more common objects, that pattern produces a you know it's an inherently redundant structure. There are no essential parts, so actually elements can be even removed in the diagrid, and the forces would find a way uh, you know of, of holding the building up. And of course, uh, a reference to Melnikov's house. Uh, in Moscow, which also, in a sense, uses a diagrid. And, you know, as, as was mentioned, uh, when the building was built, um, there are other meanings that are attached to it that are sort of out of the architect's control. And interesting that it you know, can also something, you know, essentially developed out of engineering logics resonates with, you know, certain cultural form. And when I presented this in Moscow, uh, the Russians were absolutely convinced that our project um, derived from the Melnikov project, which isn't entirely wrong, although I didn't have it, or both of us really didn't have it in mind at the time, but an architect absorbs a lot of stuff, you know, it comes out even unconsciously. There are interesting aspects to the notion of redundancy, which kind of shade from this kind of material, pure material performance in terms of structure. And so the image of the airplane on the left is a Wellington bomber. And I don't know if anyone can see it that clearly, but there are two Englishmen uh, sharing a cup of tea uh, across a huge gap where I guess flak had blown out an enormous part of the structure and the airplane was still holding itself together. Again, the kind of basket weave structure of the Wellington uh, allowed the forces to, you know, kind of reroute themselves and still hold the structure together, no essential uh, parts. So there's a, a really useful dimension of this idea of redundancy, both structurally, uh, but also in terms of the environmental effects. And Nanica will be talking about that shortly. But also, um, aside from the purely structural side, uh, there's an optical dimension to this kind of variegated pattern that we were really... Uh, very interested in taking advantage of. And that mainly pertains to the perception of scale, of the scale of a building in the city. A colleague at Princeton did an exhaustive um, analysis of the World Trade Center uh, by Minoru Yamasaki, the first one that went down in 2001. Um, and it was really fascinating that Yamasaki in order to create what are you know, basically very uniform structure, actually had to um, very carefully change the uh, steel alloy strengths in the, uh, in the tower to be able to take the uh, different loads on the tower. So it was using difference in order to produce uniformity. And our project in uh, a similar way, but almost in an inverse way, deals with uh, the variegation of the uh, concrete dimension and also reinforcing to produce a maximum amount of variation in the facade. So what, there's a kind of spectrum of you know, how one can utilize um, issues of, of geometry and material strength to, to produce very different kinds of effects in the tower. These are in some sense linked, but they're on two ends of, a, of the pole. The other thing which is, uh, was fascinating to us in, you know, in kind of producing the project, and it really uh, you know, came at a time uh, somewhat early on in the use of computation, both in the design, but also in um, the kind of effects that come out of design. Uh, was the almost uncanny resemblance of the finished product to its rendering. Uh, that historically uh, had never happened before. There was always uh, an acceptable kind of, or a kind of gap uh, between the representation and the product. But I think that this is a phenomenon, not just with our building, but I think it's a new phenomenon where you actually have the effect of a built rendering. And it was interesting too that um, 
in construction, uh, the building, uh, because of the raw concrete, appeared hypermaterial. Uh, and then it went back once it got its uh, you know, smoothness and uh, had to be painted, actually. We would want it a fair face concrete, but that was just too much of a challenge uh, for the pouring. But once it got its final coat of paint, it really, at least in the early days before the, the dust and desert sand began to produce a patina on the building, it had this stark and smooth sense of being a built rendering, it almost kind of stood out in a very strange way uh, to its neighbors. And uh, part and parcel of, you know, kind of uh, digital design um, is the, uh, you know, the use of iteration. Uh, in the design process, and you know, our um, kind of way of working with this was really um, related. You know, all of these redundant structures would work. Uh, of course, we were looking for the distribution of openings and dense areas uh, uh, to kind of optimize their relationship to the interior space, so they wouldn't be too light or too dark. But the other thing that we were uh, particularly interested in was to uh, work uh, against the kind of obvious force flow sort of appearance on the building. So we didn't want the obvious diagram. And so we were deliberately creating asymmetries that would um, defeat an easy reading of the diagram when you looked at it um, and sign it. Uh, called that a kind of force trickle down effect. So, our concern looking at all these iterations and the choices made had to do with the pattern that would uh, kind of the least uh, give an easy reading of scale and of the diagrid system, and kind of working with the diagrid against the diagrid. And so, we were also interested in you know some pop references. I remember the sea of holes and the in the 60s, the yellow submarine, the kind of uh, vacillating sense of scale and of up and down and in and out, and also the close and oblique views of the building being very important because you're, uh, on the one hand, you'll get long views of this building, but also very intense and tight views from the street and up to me were uh, you know, the most exciting. Because I like to uh, kind of post-theorize our work, uh, and I, I do that on principle, actually, that the work's got to tell you something. So it's, we are not conceptual architects in the sense that we have to have an absolutely tight idea at the beginning before we work. But rather, we, because we work iteratively, and it's a product of that, um, we begin to consider what the work is producing. We're receptive to what the work produces. And it actually allows us to think clearly about what the consequence of the project is. So the project is producing something that you couldn't have thought of, and that's very important. So in looking back at 014, uh, we developed theoretically this spectrum from uh, an expression in modernism, which we one would call, of course, skin and bones, and then uh, another kind of expression, which would be uh, on the far right, uh, the you know typical um, engineering expressionism, and our project actually falls somewhere in between, uh, which um, Antoine Picon, the um, historian, called a well-toned expression. So not to have a building that simply represents the structure and skin, as in modernism nor one that would um, overly express just the structural prowess, uh, but to utilize structure in a more uh, kind of subtle way with its optical dimension uh, to produce another kind of building expression. And uh, uh, this would be analogous to it, which is um, how in kind of cosmetic, um, how this woman has changed the scale and appearance of her face by changing her eye. Uh, so it's a material expression uh, by kind of changing the uh, appearance 
uh, she produces a new kind of effect, although it's you know kind of materially based. The other thing that was uh, kind of flowed out of uh, our experience in Rome way back when, when we were at the academy, was the um, scale readings of monolithic structures. So I remember being absolutely floored uh, by uh, the Pyramid of Cestius in Rome, which especially in a foggy day where you couldn't look at, you know, see the blocks, you only saw the profile. At certain distances, the pyramid looked huge. And then the shock of actually getting closer to the Pyramid of Cestius and realizing it's actually relatively small. That, and then the other side of it, which it had to do with a, a heavily featured uh, object. This is a toad, uh, and it uses that for camouflage. And O14, in a way, deals with both of those uh, notions of kind of a monolith, fairly simple monolith, at the same time uh, bringing a highly featured uh, kind of opening field to it. And it what it does to your perception. So, uh, depending upon your proximity, the tower can look big or small. It 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 doesn't ever really look like it's twenty two stories because you can't read uh, the levels. And so that was part of uh, our exploration of you know the kind of presence of the tower in the city and with its neighbors, how it would be perceived. So the, uh, this slide shows the O14, O14 and the construction of Burj Khalifa. This one, this area could be all built up, but we don't really, I think it, it did. So this is our plan and I'll explain the program in there. And we have exoskeleton, which support, a slab is supported by the uh, tongues. So, we have a five-story parking uh, structure underground, and then we have a public space and the lobbies, and also office uh, connected to office bridges and then podiums. And then on top of that, we have a, a offices and then rooftop. So this is the typical uh, modernist uh, office layout, but the others are uh, quite different. Yeah, this is really to illustrate, this is a George Tucker painting, it's to illustrate the kind of anomie and uh, depressing regularity of the modernist kind of office space on subjects. Uh, there are no offices like this, but they, some of them are damn close. So our um, tower is not the norm normative uh, column field. In fact, it's different. And then uh, it has a dark and light space because of the different openings. And then people can gather in the different areas. And so the office layout could be quite free. So this was our ideal kind of uh, diagram for how office space could be designed. Although in, in actual fact, most of the offices, if not all of them, uh, have a more normative layout, but the ambition in the facade was to have uh, you know, different zones to kind of change the hierarchy and regularity of office space to produce a different kind of workspace. So this one shows the uh, typical office uh, layout, which we didn't do, but you can see the relationship of human scale and also the scale of our Holes. This building, uh, all parking lot is underground, and which major slab is supported by normative column field. And on top of that, all 14 footings are sitting on that. And then we came up, we thought it's too expensive to do every holes are different. So we came up with five different uh, variations of the holes, but uh, because of curvature of the Facade, it has more variations, but also with the uh, standardized uh, hall size, uh, save lots of money. Oh, this is the awful thing under construction. You can see very interesting structural system, but also we lack form of the holes with the uh, 
for mica kind of uh, materials. Otherwise, the hole get distorted because of weight of the concrete. And then the end, we end up making the forms for whole, all build, uh, all holes. And then it, once you cast, every uh, form is destroyed. So we could have a different size of holes. This building it has a one meter gap between exoskeleton and a uh, glass wall, window walls, and it creates interesting effect. So this one shows animations and also showing the how air flow in between the window wall and exoskeleton. It's uh, saved 30% of, because of that, it saved 30% of the cooling, cooling cost. cost. And then uh, the, the podium level has a, a few bridges attaching to the main towers, which is connected to the slab of the towers, but also created the big, uh, because of the, we don't, we depress the parking, it's uh, create a big public space on the ground. So you can go through the building from front to the uh, river side. And this one shows the lobby between shell and also window wall. And also you can see the, uh, the uh, connection of slab connection to the shell. Okay, so this is the looking down from rooftop. You see the series of uh, tongues connecting to the uh, shell. Because of different size of holes, and then it's randomly placed. You can see the different frame, the different view of the site. And this is night view of the all floating lobby. This one shows the hole is going concave and concave facade. And this is the reception desk. And actually, all floating building was built in a few years. Um, but this reception desk took almost more than one year to build. Building is much quicker than building furniture here. So you can see the uh, Tom Cruise uh, crawling up the neighboring buildings, and you can see all 14 on the side. This is all 14 in night views. On to the Taipei Music Center in Taiwan. This was more than 10 years in development before it was handed out in competition. And it was a project that was really motivated by the Taiwanese government to recognize their music industry because it was among the first in uh, Asia after Japan to have a uh, you know, really vibrant music production culture, especially for popular music. So various offices, mainly in Taipei, producers, performers, etc., and the government decided to bring them all together and essentially create a new district in the city of Taipei that would be devoted to musical production and performance. They were feeling, of course, the pressure from other you know, countries in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, Japanese, a kind of burgeoning K-pop, and also the Chinese music industry. So they felt the need to really give the identity not only you know, to the sound, but also to a place in Taipei to make it uh, iconic. And that was really part of, like many competitions, the, the kind of demand to make the project iconic was really built into the competition. It also kind of put a strain on us to critically reconsider what iconic buildings are, what they can do, uh, and what an iconic chunk of city, no less, uh, should be like, uh, especially in relation to uh, popular music, which was also something uh, I would have to say at the outset, we were essentially unfamiliar with. We were coming in as outsiders uh, and had to kind of quickly learn uh, what the kind of landscape of popular music in Taiwan was about. But also it gave us the opportunity uh, to collaborate in a really uh, exciting way with the producers and the artists who were part of the uh, group, you know, that formed the competition and to work together to produce, uh, you know, a viable uh, center. In terms of context, we were looking at degraded industrial area at the periphery of Taipei that was about to undergo kind of massive change. You can see a big rail yard there. There were 
all automotive chop shops and an old paint factory. So we couldn't and didn't want to take cues from the building context. But what was really extraordinary uh, was the physical context that Taipei was built very fast in beautiful kind of subtropical mountainous terrain. And so that was really the uh, kind of major aspect of context that we were responding to. It wouldn't be a matter of trying to emulate uh, existing buildings, but rather how this complex would fit into uh, the kind of gorgeous natural landscape that we hope to kind of bring out uh, in clearing the site and creating not only the buildings, but the landscape and the urban space. Now, it was a peculiar site in that it was actually not just one, but two. One uh, kind of contained site and another very long, narrow strip. And the other thing that was of uh, you know interest to us was to produce not a building as urbanism, which is a kind of typical, I don't know, OMA actually, kind of masters as at that actually trying to bring the city into a building. Our competitors followed the OMA model more or less uh, by trying to consolidate all of the functions of this uh, center in a massive building. But we figured that, you know, we actually have a real extended site. We can do a piece of, of urbanism, starting with kind of notionally the model of a stadium, of course, is a single focus, it's either open or it's closed. We looked at urban morphology. This comes out of even Aldo Rossi, work with Rossi, of the circus, of the Roman circus for an outdoor performance space. What we did with the morphology was essentially cut the ends of the circus off out to make it a space you could move in, branched it across to the other site, which, you know, uh, has the main hall. And it, it was about, you know, creating a kind of uh, extended space and a kind of focused space, but also linking them together uh, with the bridge. The project really changed quite a bit from its competition stage, what we presented then, to when the music industry came in. They actually almost doubled the number of seats in the main hall. We had to reconsider that. We also had to redesign in a radical way. Uh, the long, narrow site, but the basic components uh, remain from the beginning. That is the main performance hall, a cube, which is a hall of fame and museum and archive and cafe, and then uh, what is called the industry shell, which is really more of a kind of technical uh, production house. And between that on the long site is a very large um, kind of open air uh, performance space. So this is a Kind of view of uh, of the main hall is a very kind of wide fan shaped plan, and as you can see, connected across the street by a bridge, which just shows the the structural um, steel design, and then uh, later on how it was uh, clad. An interesting part of the of Taipei is the use of uh, bridges to cross major streets. And we took that as an occasion uh, to create essentially a new horizon in the project, an elevated horizon. So the project can, in a very general sense, be divided between groundwork buildings, which would form fabric of lower structures, and I'll get into that in a second, and then object buildings. So the cube, the shell-shaped form of the hall, all rest on an elevated kind of horizon or a podium and are visible uh, from anywhere within the site. When one gets into the design of the main hall, that bridge passes through the facade and essentially branches and wraps an inner core, which is ultimately the, what, what we call the inner crystal, which was the kind of enclosure uh, for the auditorium inside. So moving from inside to outside, the circulation is continuous and then and it changes and feeds uh, the inner core, which is the auditorium. But it's understood as one continuous bridge from across the street through the facade and then wrapping the main hall. And then there's this exterior uh, shell, which again kind of responds to that split section in the horizon. The steel work, you know, really was massive. And I would say, you know, um, our um, initial schemes had much lighter structure, but when it went to, uh, you know, 
kind of in, in, in relationship to the codes, the seismic codes and so forth, it became a very robust, uh, but very interesting in a kind of structural design. Cladding was also something that we were you know, interested in. Uh, well, the challenge of dealing with, this of course is a substructure, this is the decking, uh, but then we later, of course, got into detailing uh, the skin of the building. And I was particularly interested in this uh, kind of color, this uh, uh, aluminum alloy co color, which is actually uh, comes from Japan. It's called alamite finish. Uh, and it was originally designed for aircraft. Uh, instead of a silver aircraft, they use this peculiar gold, greenish gold color which would blend to sea and sky for the planes. And we thought that would be a really interesting kind of finish for the building because it, would, it changes color and it really does depending upon the ambient light, that sort of uh, goldish color. And then the other thing, which also derives from my interest in aircraft was um, how to detail uh, of standing seam and corrugated system. So there were, it was a kind of beautiful tour de force of detailing corrugated material in uh, this detail of a Junkers 52 transport where you can see almost uh, micro corrugations at every joint. So we we're kind of very interested in the way to deal with a pretty common, you know, it was standing seam, not corrugated, but um, how to deal with joining those elements up when you have a non-normative you kind know, of form for the building. So you can see a kind of detail here at the entrance. And there were a lot of things that, you know, one could only sort of learn while it was in construction. For example, the subtle curvature of some of these uh, panels uh, were actually just torqued into place uh, by the men on the site. And so in the uh, kind of um, the mock-ups, we were able to argue for more of that kind of work and actually not cheap in the building because it wouldn't have to be rolled in those subtle curves that could just be pushed into place. But that was something that had to be proven by the workers on the site. But we you know, spent an inordinate amount of time detailing both the glazing and the, and the connections to the cladding. And this is a view uh, at the lowest most level. This is a two level approach to the theater. There's ground level approach, which is this lower lobby, which will be used for um, uh, special events when they have a red carpet, it will happen in this lower level. And then there's an upper entry as well at the level of horizon level, which uh, is an approach for the general public, especially when they cross the street on the bridge. But it's a very intense space between the inner and outer shell. Uh, the various lobbies and balconies uh, kind of occupy that in-between space and produce you know, a, a really exciting uh, kind of sectional condition that everyone can experience. And you can see also the articulated structure. I apologize for the applied baseboard. These are the kinds of things that happen when you're remote. Well, we would have much preferred it being smooth on the baseboard, but this is what happens in projects this big. Anyway, yeah, and this is you know, the life of an architect. This was one of the, um, in the early test performances how the crowds would use. You can see people up on that balcony coming from the upper bridge, as well as occupying this lower level uh, space in the dual lobby. And then this is a view from the, um, from the, the uh, audience to the main stage with the stage door open and one of the first performances. You can see Nanako gives a sense of the kind of scale of that bridge connection. And then this is an overall view of uh, the center. There also are you know, two huge live houses on either side of that plaza. Those are clubs. 
as well as the music production facility and then the Hall of Fame, which is that cube in the foreground. And this is the entry into the main plaza during construction, of course. This is a little later on, the kind of industry shell, which also acts as a kind of cover for the outdoor performance space has now been illuminated and they were doing a lot of tests on that, on illuminating that uh, screen structure, the view from the kind of outside of the site. Ultimately, this whole area will be lined with uh, retail and shops. So uh, an important aspect of this complex is that it was really meant to be a 24 hour place. So when there are no performances, this works, uh, this urban space works for shopping and dining, uh, green markets, so forth. So it would always be, you know, uh, kind of active and would also, uh, you know, be significant for the local people who aren't interested necessarily in going to a musical performance. They would use this space. It would become essentially part of the fabric of the city. Another thing that was part of the kind of a assumption we made was that once the project is in place, and this actually happened, uh, they changed the codes for building on the rest of the site around it. They realized that, uh, you know, foregrounding the kind of natural characteristics of the site, uh, you know, was really a benefit to the rest of Taipei. So uh, the project actually had a very good effect on the way they thought about future planning. Uh, so not to immediately run to trying to copy the context, but to bring out uh, aspects of the context, the, uh, the natural part of the context. So this is a view earlier on of the main staircase looking back towards the Hall of Fame. Those staircases actually will be, it'll be a museum. The staircases that you see on the facade uh, will have the history of pop music in Taiwan. This is a a view looking out of that cube, you know, towards the rest of the site. And from the bridge point of view from the main hall, Manico in front of the Hall of Fame up on the roof. So you can really see, we, we try to articulate those object buildings. They really, they kind of have a very, uh, a reveal underneath them uh, to really objectify the three major components of the project. And that sense of elevated horizon, again, was really important. Okay, so this is Taiwan government government initiated uh, this port terminal, and originally it is still a, a big container uh, port for Taiwan, the biggest, and then also one of the biggest in the world. The main purpose is that they like to bring the uh, a lot of tourists from the mainland China, but also it's very close to Japan and Korea. So this is sort of an overview of um, the functioning of the terminal. So this is looking from the entrance. So you can see every terminal from the entrance. So you know where- All the way out go. to the boats. Yes. So this is from the decking. So elevated public space. And then looking down, there are restaurants, it's really multifunctional complex. So the uh, the vessel type is a uh, world cruise ship and the international cruise ship and also international fast ferry and the domestic ferry is coming into this port town. The same time it's acting still um, the uh, the container port and then this uh, the site is connected to the uh, pedestrian walk to of the city. We were asked to do a master plan, not only for the port terminal and tower, but also to reconsider how a public edge would work in an industrial waterfront. So our concept was an elevated uh, kind of deck that buildings would be set upon. So the, the elevated deck would be for the kind of public use and amenity use, and the industrial waterfront uh, would continue at grade. So you see the uh, a skeleton view from the uh, water and which is sitting on the podium. 
So again, the lobes, uh, the kind of more sculptural lobes are the different port uh, terminal buildings. And then the tower is for the port of authority of uh, Taiwan, uh, of Kaohsiung, excuse me, where they do all of the business of the port. So our schematic concept brings together all uh, necessary uses. So the, uh, the, the ground level is services, and then public above, and then terminal is in between sandwiches to, from these two uh, programs. So the, uh, the, this is the, uh, the, the first ground level is the uh, service plus passenger coming in. And then second level is the, uh, uh, what is it? I like, no, no. It's the yeah. departure hall and. Yeah. Yes, and also the tower is for the Port Authority. And this is the view from the street. And the facade is coming in now. And then this uh, office space, this uh, organization of the port terminal is not the typical column field, but also uh, or it's when you go in, it's towards to the each uh, terminals. And also from the podium level, it's overlapping with the port terminal entrance to also the uh, decking areas. Uh, so the passenger can go straight into the uh, terminal, but also they can see the activity on the deck, uh, the uh, decking, so that they can join that if they have a time. We worked with our logistics on the second phase of this, so it's really patterned on um, an airport terminal kind of diagram where you can depart, you get dropped off on an upper level, go straight to the plane, or in this case, a ship, and then uh, uh, when you, you get off, you go down to a lower level drop off. And then we, of course, have the upper level public space. So international crews, uh, they had to go through the custom. And this is the uh, view from entrance. You see every uh, terminals and also the amenities. From one point of view on entry. So it's a big um, kind of manifold, like an exhaust manifold that splits and large tubes of space guide you to your ships or to the Port Authority Tower. And this is the view to the uh, one of the lobes. And then a structure is a box trusses. And this is view from the, the terminal. Well, this is actually a view from yeah, the, the deck, oh. from the elevated deck. And we will ultimately, there will be uh, kind of retail and restaurants at that level that will look down into the terminal. And the view from the end of the law from the uh, pedestrian boardwalk. And this is under construction. They, uh, they started to put the facade so that we, uh, they are uh, attaching the facade to the substructure. Cladding is aluminum and also has a three layer of powder coating. So it will be very strong with the salty wind from the ocean. And each um, cladding is attached to the each uh, uh, floor slabs. And you see, is, you see the uh, major structure under the cladding. I also would mention that um, Israel Sinek, the same structural engineer as 014, it, it was actually his last uh, design project before he passed away. His design concept for the structure essentially unchanged. Uh, from competition to kind of realized building, which wasn't the case at all with uh, Taipei Pop. And our roof geometry is as, looks like a spine. And also this is designed to respond to heavy uh, rain and a storm in Taipei. And then this is a time-lapse film of the construction that the uh, contractor did. Oh, it's fascinating to see what the boats are doing in the harbor. And that concludes our 
uh, lecture. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse and Nanako, for such an enlightening uh, lecture. I was uh, really amazed to see some of the developments of your projects and, and, and very happy to see the Taipei uh, Music Center uh, completed. And uh, you mentioned that the Kaohsiun uh, Center would be, or Ferry Terminal, sorry, would be uh, completed in uh, 2021. Is that correct? Um, yes. Most likely uh, late, late spring 2021. Well, I mean, in light of the, the circumstances, that's that's actually also really good news. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Uh, we do have some questions here. And uh, one started, one, as, as soon as you started the, the, the lecture, uh, someone asked uh, about some of the books that you were talking about. So I put some links and I did find the O14 uh, projection and perception on Amazon actually. I'm not sure if you were aware of that, but it is on Amazon now. And uh, I also put a couple of links for Projects Under Consequences, the latest uh, book by Raisa Romomoto, as well as The Atlas of Novel Tectonics, my personal favorite. Um, so yeah, thanks again for, for, the, for, the, for, for showcasing your great body of work. And um, I was just wondering, I mean, I'll start by myself asking a question. Uh, to what extent do you feel that the research that you do and the extensive teaching that, uh, and involvement in academia uh, that you partake in uh, influences your work or, um, uh, I mean, both on the level of, 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 of uh, giving credibility to the work, but also on the level of uh, actually uh, building and, and getting to know architecture in terms of uh, detailing and, and conceptualization and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and constructing these ideas. Uh, how do you think that influence impacts your, your body of work? I mean, I, I would say that, you know, it, it changed over time. Um, we were fortunate, you know, to start our main teaching in the early 90s with a cohort of very talented people at Columbia University. So at that point, um, there were also, uh, you know, competition culture was much stronger. And so this young faculty would all join the competition. And then we would, most of us, of course, would never win those. But it became a platform for exploring the shared ideas in the 90s anyway. Um, you know, we would have a whatever, you know, a kind of post-mortem presentation among ourselves. Uh, and then it would also publish the work and theorize the work. That belonged to a certain period, I think, uh, both you know, for ourselves, but also in architecture, where that was what was happening, and it was happening at that institution. So it was enormously invaluable, actually, in terms of you know, um, having a shared interest in, in directions of work and exchanging it. And the competition heated in a really productive way, heated up. Uh, the creation of that work. And then, of course, we get older, moved on, you know, Nanako remained at Columbia for a short time, but then other schools, I went to Princeton. Um, so that kind of uh, dynamic didn't continue, like all things, schools has a certain lifespan with a certain direction of work, but uh, I think it sort of set the pattern for our practice for better or worse. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, in the States anyway, uh, you know, people uh, in a certain area of architecture both teach and practice for that reason, for, you know, the kind of exchange, the inter intellectual simulation, and one does a studio to test ideas out. You right. know, you don't, I don't, typically it's not about getting ideas from the students, but that you have, you know, if you have uh, an idea, uh, you know, you get very smart people developing ideas and, uh, you know, creating new work. So it creates a culture for architecture, which, I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things that's um, lamentably not recognized. I would say architecture still, though we're really on the edge, but it still actually has a tradition. Mm -hmm. It's still there is continuity, 
as opposed, say, to the art world, where it's, I would say, almost ironically, more commercialized than architecture. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's why we're teaching. You know, it's it, it's that. It's just the, the thirst for that, the experimentation. Yeah, also, it's helped us to develop the ideas. It's not the getting ideas from them, but yeah. the help us to develop our own ideas. And if you have a 10 students, you can develop 10 different ideas. So which is very yeah. interesting. Go through them and, and, and something emerges from that and, process. And your colleagues see it and you know, you're sharing work too. It's a community. So in, in an ideal sense, I mean, I think it was really very much that way at Columbia for 10 years. It's not the same for me, say at Princeton now, but you sort of have enough, you've accumulated enough that you know, you can shift into another mode in your career. We do have some questions from the audience here and um, uh, we'll start with the live question. Actually, I think Marina uh, raised her hand here to be promoted to panelists and to all the other attendees, you have that option to uh, use the raise hand tool to be promoted to panelists and ask the question live on camera. Um, or you can type your questions in the Q&A box and I will read them out uh, to uh, Jesse and Nanako. So uh, for now, uh, we welcome uh, Marina to join the conversation. Um, I think she's trying to log in. We also have uh, Coco coming up. Hi, Marina, how are you doing? Where are you logging Hi. in? Hello, I'm in Buenos Aires, uh, uh, in La Plata, in Argentina. Hello. Hello, Lucy. Hello. Like, uh, just a second. Uh, let me see. It. Okay. Yeah. So you okay. Had a yes. Uh, I I have a question. Uh, uh, I was thinking about um, you mentioned this idea of uh, looking back uh, in your uh, designs, and I think it, uh, it's a super interesting idea. I mean, uh, I, I was thinking about um, this kind of genealogy which is a retroactive and fictional genealogy because in a way you use uh, you didn't use this concept or this uh, this uh, designs uh, or at least non consciously how to say maybe yes the concept but you mentioned this uh, for example Melnikov's house mm -hmm. that it was something that uh, it's uh, after a comment in Russia so I, I was thinking that now that you are conscious about this genealogy that you reveal this uh, idea mm -hmm. of uh, and maybe references or things. So I, I was thinking how, uh, I was wondering, how do you think that this genealogy can influence uh, um, future designs? Hmm. How the genealogy would influence, well, I think it, it, you know, it brings into focus, you know, I'm, I would say that, you know, in some respect, it, it's like Bo a Borges argument, I think, but um, I mean, in some respect, Melnikov was facing or kind of working with a similar problem set. So even though, you know, we weren't consciously sort of looking at Melnikov, there was a kind of coincidence, uh, you know, of similar interests. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think the whole idea of a retrospective theorization is that you can um, then go to the next project more clear about what is important. Uh, you know, that that has given you new, in, that kind of consideration has given you new information, which has come out of the work you produced. And then you can very deliberately advance that line of work after having considered all of the ramifications or even the things you didn't do, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. the, the project 014 is an artifact. There were always other ways one could go. And just that kind of clarification allows you to think, well, what's the next thing? So for example, um, I mean, it's really kind of dumb, but this is the reality of, you know, just architecture, but, the holes in the 014 project were all normal to the surface. They were all straight punches. And so even the simple idea of saying, well, okay, let's, we're going to do 
a similar thing with um, the concrete shell, but now we're going to deal with variations of um, angles of the holes. And so that really, in a very literal way, um, gave us the idea for what to do with um, the uh, Shenzhen airport proposal. But it, yeah, we wouldn't have thought about it unless, you know, we, we had gone through 014, but it was like a little incremental step, a change, but then it, you know, cascades into its sort of variations and so forth. But it's those little things which, I don't know. I mean, they're almost, you, they are um, very simple and in a way very dumb, but then they, you know, produce new effects. <laughs> Not totally rethinking it, but it's just changing the angle. Well, what if those angles, you know, have a flexibility instead of being straight punches? What does it do? I was thinking this in, in this direction because, in a way, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I'm a teacher here in Buenos Aires, and uh, I think it's absolutely, I mean, it's super important to be conscious about certain processes, even when it's uh, this, uh, this uh, looking back uh, way, as you say, or retroactive, but it's important to be conscious about the processes to uh, rethink some things and to think about future uh, designs as well. Because today we have this idea of architecture. It doesn't matter the process. It's like you right. go just to the result and you you don't think about the process that you, you, you did. Right. But so I, I, I think it's also, you know, you do the project and you move on to next, but unconsciously, not unconsciously, but probably unconsciously, these accumulation of these ideas mm. yeah. they have, comes up. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. yeah. Peter Cook had a wonderful line about this. I mean, like they asked him about, you know, how he does projects and why he does projects. And he said that, um, well, you know, if I don't learn something new from what I do, then it's I, I'm wasting my time. Or if I knew from the beginning, it's pointless even to do it. Yeah. It's yeah. So it's. You know, being receptive to what you actually produce, which is always, always different from what you thought it was, mm -hmm. right, is something to be very attentive to, I would say. <laughs> okay, thanks. Not a pure, I mean, this has been a problem at Princeton because the students think that conceptual is good. In other words, that they won't make a move, mm. um, you know, unless they had everything worked out in their head, which is impossible. Right. Yes. There's another Boris story about a man it's who remembered it. Also, it also talks about that. <laughs> okay, Most thanks. people can remember a cube, a sphere, and a triangle, but this guy could remember every branch and every leaf on a tree and be able to regurgitate, but it's impossible. So, yeah. It's also true. Thanks. Thanks Thank for your answer. Great yeah. time. Thank you for your question. Thanks. Um, we have a uh, question here from Coco. Uh, she's saying, hi, I'm Konstantin Koko from Indonesia. I've seen some projects that you've created, such as the Osaka New Museum, uh, Pingshan uh, Theater, and many other cultural projects. I don't know if my question is relevant or not, but I would like to ask if you, uh, how to make our articulation possible without uh, disrupting the existing culture of its space? Because I, I think it sounds easy, but hard to turn into reality. Thank you. Uh, the original culture, you mean, of the um, the place of the place itself. So, so uh, I think uh, the overarching question is: How can you introduce uh, a, a new uh, typology or a, a new type of architecture mm. spa a place without? Uh, yeah, she's saying yes. Uh, that's yeah. what she, without. Yeah, without. I mean, I think one of the things that I. Um, uh, this was really something that Jeffrey Kipnis uh, clearly articulated, mm -hmm. is that I think uh, many times we have, a, uh, architects have a very limited uh, sense of, of what context means. Mm -hmm. you know, that isn't just the real estate or the buildings around the project that there, you know, is a cultural context, there's a there is a kind of physical context, like we were talking about the nature of the site and deliberately ignoring the buildings in 
the outskirts of Taipei because they actually were pretty bad and were going to go away anyway. Um, so it, it's, it's about very selectively, you know, choosing what aspects, say, of the physical context mm -hmm. that we, you know, in our best judgment uh, would be important to move to respond to, but also to recognize that um, architecture has its own context. Right. And if you believe that architecture, you know, is important, it's not something you'll find there, but you'll bring something valuable, you know, to the place. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it already, you know, I mean, I guess there are a lot of people who think that that brings, it's a violent, um, I don't intrusion on uh, existing context, but actually I think that uh, if it's done well, is actually what culture is all about. It's not about arresting meanings, uh, you know, of a long past, which probably never really existed that way anyway. It's about recognizing the vitality and the um, legitimacy of new ideas, doing them sensitively, of course, uh, not being you know, brutal, uh, but you know, recognizing the value of the new uh, is as important. So that's as much a part of the context, the multiple contexts that uh, you know we try to deal with, not one. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Santiago is asking uh, to elaborate a bit more about the interest, uh, your interest in military vehicles and mechanics like warplanes, for example. And I remember reading a few chapters from the Atlas of Novel Tectonics that talked about how mm -hmm. uh, the, the structure of an airplane to one of the roof structures that you designed, mm -hmm. which I found very interesting. And how does it relate to your discipline's tradition, both in terms of uh, form and typology? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I, I think one of the things that, you know, I found uh, that was kind of liberating, you know, looking at an allied yet different discipline um, was that there were connections back. So, for example, one of the things that was talked about at the Atlas was this geode geodetic structure. And, uh, you know, there are geodesic structures by people like Fuller that you could argue are kind of firmly within the canons at this point of architecture. But there were amazing inventions done in an allied field in aeronautics with exactly the same geometrical principles that were much more, um, in a way, developed and fluid. So... In geodesic structures of Fuller always dealt with the ideality of the dome and uh, repetition of similar parts. I have no doubt because at that point, you know, it was most economical and he was interested in the weight of buildings more than you know, how they looked. Um, but the geodetic structure, uh, which, you know, came from airplanes, uh, had to deal with much more complex form making. And the inclusion of, um, I don't know, systems, building systems, heating, blah, 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 all of these other systems and how they react to the structure. So uh, it, it was that, it's that kind of thing. They're similar. They're from another field, but they're, you know, they're different. Um, so finding those kinds of connections back to our discipline uh, was really exciting. I mean, I, I, I'm a hobbyist. I was interested in airplanes since I'm four, so I was aware of the geodetic system. It's like, this is great. We're going to, you know, we can advance Fuller's ideas in a new vector because of, uh, you know, that kind of invention. But that's what it typically do. I don't know, in relation to typology, it's almost a separate issue, I guess I would say. Uh, it's almost... The systems per se are atypological, but they can be applied to typologies. Yeah. yeah. Um, Marina already asked her question live, and uh, I think that that brings us to the end of the questions, actually. So, okay. uh, so much for your time, uh, Jesse and uh, Nanako. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the time that you've given to this, and, and I'm sure all the uh, people watching this lecture and will be watching the recording would appreciate uh, you sharing 
uh, this uh, wealth of knowledge and, and very exciting projects. And uh, fingers crossed for the upcoming openings of uh, these these really great buildings. Uh, so uh, thanks again. I'm very honored that you joined us and, and I hope we stay connected. Our pleasure. It was a lot Thank of fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. See you. Bye-bye, everybody.